So, is there even a pot of money at the end of the rainbow? Some <laughs> days it feels like that pot gets ever more elusive. Sometimes uh, there's a lot to discuss. The we're in a weird period where it's not quite bull, not quite bear. We're thawing out of a a winter, as it were. We've got some great panelists to unpack the current state of crypto VC. So maybe we'll just do a quick round of introductions. I'm Frank Chaparro, the editor at large at The Block, and we can just go through the list. Remember, there's a difference between introducing yourself and pontificating ad nauseum. So give the audience a quick intro. Katrina. Hey, guys. I'm Katrina. Um, I am an investment partner at Portal Ventures. We are a business model-centric protocol investment firm based out of New York. Hey, uh, this is Raneet. Um one of the uh, investment partners at Ethereal Ventures. We're a Web3 firm that was set up by what constituted, constituted the, the former venture investment team at Consensus, and um, we just like to back um, domain experts and really technical teams uh, building in Web3. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Shar. I'm co-founder and managing partner at a firm called Multicoin Capital. We're active investors in the crypto space across public and private markets. Hello, everybody. My name is Alexander Tkachenko. I'm a, a founder and CEO of VNX. And in my previous life, I was a managing partner of 2BLU, one of the uh, few uh, active VCs six or seven years ago that started to invest into um, crypto or blockchain companies. Perfect. In Europe. Fantastic. So let's start with an overview. What is the state of crypto venture capital right now as you see it in your seat? I think there are some very exciting development over the past one or two weeks, as we saw. Uh, it might have been the ETF uh, ticker coming on DTCC, but it turns out it's been listing there since August. But still, I think market from a technical analysis that we've um, BTC has reclaimed its 200-day uh, average, and that's usually a sign that we officially, or according to the technical analysis, came out of the bear market. Whether it will self-correct and go back down a little bit, we don't know. But it has been a while where we're in this low state, and there are upcoming catalysts. And the reason why I'm saying BTC is it's usually um, the leader of um, the entire market, and it will, the liquidity will flow once um, the BTC essentially reclaims its, um, its popularity. And the next year, we have Bitcoin happening have um, more the ETF news coming online. So from me personal view, I, I am very optimistic. Cautiously, was very optimistic. Mm. To, share how, to what extent do those, more, uh, those moves, the momentum on the liquid side of the market, translate into venture? Is there a lag? Uh, obviously, people see a lot of excitement right now with ETF, to Katrina's point, but is that necessarily translating into an increase in deal flow or uh, more venture activity? Because that's, I mean, been stuck in the doldrums for over a year. Uh, it is translating into more, but how much more is, is mm. really the question. Uh, because when you're a venture investor, right, you need to see exits. Mm -hmm. So then you have capital to recycle back into newer projects. You know, you need to distribute out to LPs, raise your next fund, and now you have more money to go invest in earlier projects. In this case, in this specific bear market, I don't actually think there was ever a shortage of capital for venture deals. Uh, I think there was a shortage of deals, mm. actually. I think there was a shortage of entrepreneurs. So yes, the public market's thawing here, and this recent rally is welcome, and it doesn't hurt. Uh, but I don't think the main benefit from it is coming from the capital market side of more capital available. I think the main benefit is coming from entrepreneurs feeling safer to go quit their jobs and found a company, or entrepreneurs feeling like it's a better time to go raise their next round if they've already started a company. It's a really good point. It sort of paints a picture of a dichotomy that I think exists between the early stage, this new wave of entrepreneurs that are maybe more comfortable to enter the market, to your point, while it's at the same time, right, you still have 50, 80 some odd unicorns that raised in the previous cycle that, what are they doing now? Where's their pot at the end of the rainbow? 
doesn't seem like it's there. You think about the 80 some odd unicorns that, you know, we're hearing whisperings of down rounds, even despite the rosier picture that Katrina painted. What, what's your opinion on that, Alex? I actually would share this opinion. I think in the last bull run, when the money was cheap, a lot of companies uh, uh, raised money on, uh, let's put it, very optimistic uh, expectations of the growth. And uh, now LPs uh, specifically see that the growth is not necessarily there. At the same time, you can have quite good yields on the bond markets. Um, and it's somehow, I think, geopolitical situation, changes in the macroeconomy, or just overall feeling of uncertainty, does not necessarily uh, permit to uh, fund large deals in the, you know, like B round plus, I would say. Mm -hmm. I think seed stage, post seed stage are probably okay, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, large checks, in my view, is a little bit of a problem. Yeah, the risk-free rate being above 5% is bad for anyone who raised above a billion, even maybe 500 last cycle. But there's ample opportunities in this earlier stage. That sounds, that sounds like that's the foundation on which we can dive deeper into this conversation. How have you maybe thought differently, um, Praneeth, about how you're investing in, in early stage Web3 projects relative to maybe years past? I think um, it's, it's always helpful to have a historical point of reference um, to, to kind of see how companies in the Web3 space have performed, what, what kind of business models have worked in the past, what are the failures that, that teams have experienced while they were building in the space, and that in and of itself is a relatively useful um, way for, for us to kind of have some data points in terms of understanding how sustainable businesses are. Um, it's also interesting where we're seeing signs in the public markets as it relates to there being more of a correlation between token prices and metrics that matter for protocols, and markets actually taking that into account, barring a few idiosyncratic price changes. And so in, in one way, shape, and sense, I think it's, it's this notion of maturity that is coming to crypto as an asset class. That's, that's what's helpful to, to, to kind of see. Mm. And so we've, we've always been very focused on, you know, like founders who've been obsessed about building product, people who've been thinking of, you know, like they're their domains from a very long time. But it's also very helpful um, for, for us to understand what their true intents are as it relates to building a commercially successful and viable business. Cost, again, in the, the light of decentralization that we're seeing. So. So that's, that's, that's been important for us to understand and engage. It's interesting because it's, you're, you're talking less about maybe the, the parameters that shape your thesis and more so the, the, the way in which you maybe analyze a certain deal that comes through. Are we maturing? Are there new metrics or, or data points uh, through which you can uh, suss out a deal? We primarily focus on pre-seed, so really there's very little data point to work off of. Um, that's why our approach is very much thesis driven and know what you're looking for versus what's not. Um, the challenge or the beauty, uh, two sides of the same coin, is crypto every day, there are new things happening. And um, if you don't pay attention for even a day, you're kind of out of the loop. So there could be a lot of noise. That's why kind of the emphasis on having a thesis, know exactly here's the future vision of where we see the space would go, and here's the gap, and we want to fill that gap, hence, hey, like these deals we want to look immediately. I will even go to say most of the deal we've done actually come from outbound research driven, because the benefit are twofold. When you do the, market re uh, do the research of a sector, you meet people, experts, who are either building something or they will build something. So you get it early, especially important for early stage um, fun like myself. And the second one is once you publish out your thought leadership, you attract very high quality inbound because mm. then you think along the same line. So that's very much the driving force of our investment. Mm, interesting. If you're really looking to sift the noise out of the equation, there's a great tool called the Block Data Dashboard. Absolutely. Okay? And you also have the Block Deals Dashboard as well. Definitely something to check out.
Thank you for the plug. So how does that sort of jive with the way you're approaching things at Multicoin? Is it, is it uh, because you guys used to be quite prolific um, in terms of putting out research and, and uh, kind of uh, outlining your thesis. Um, has that approach changed in, in this current market? No, not really. I mean, we still put out content. Now, look, we're not content producers. Like, we don't have to publish. So we only publish when we have something interesting to say. And sometimes we have less interesting things to say, and sometimes we have more interesting things to say. Uh, but no, what Katrina said resonates very much with us in terms of looking at the thesis, being qualitative investors rather than quantitative investors. I think uh, this industry is not mature enough for quantitative investment. Mm. And in fact, it leads to a sense of false precision mm. where people use what I think are absolutely garbage metrics like TVL, or active addresses. Mm. I mean, I hate these metrics because you're just lying to yourself about something and trying to convince yourself that this is a good investment thesis because of these numbers. Uh, and I think the best investments in crypto will be made on qualitative feedback rather than, oh, well, this chain has more active addresses than this chain, I think means nothing. It's, a, it's an interesting point that raises a question. Um, so, so to your point, right, you can have these various metrics and they might um, create these like blind spots for other ways to examine a project. How do you invest in multiple, if you sort of are really deep into one ecosystem, how do you ensure that that also doesn't create a blind spots for opportunities across other, other chains? I mean, you have to go to the events, you have to you have to continuously be asking yourself, if I was wrong, what would it look like, right? So obviously we're very heavily invested in the Solana ecosystem at Multicoin, right? We invested in Solana before they launched. We've invested in a bunch of Solana teams, but we do our best to not be blindsided and wonder, well, if another ecosystem was going to win, what would that look like? And what should we be looking for? And what we're specifically looking for is entrepreneurs building net new, unique products in different ecosystems. Your ecosystem has a liquid staking token and a borrow lend marketplace and an NFT exchange. I don't care. That's not, that's table stakes, right? Like that's just not enough. Your ecosystem has something that's truly unique that a entrepreneur chose to build there deliberately and not just because you threw money at them. Now you have my attention. Hmm. It's an interesting point. Um, Alex, how do, you, how do you sort of think about the, 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 the new wave of entrepreneurs that have maybe entered into this space, this cycle? Is there anything different? I hear a lot more about consumer than maybe uh, previous cycles where, where DeFi uh, was, was king. What, what sort of maybe defines the profile of this new wave of entrepreneurs? Um, in my view, the uh, ecosystem, or in general, blockchain has matured enough. So what we start to see is the real-world problems that it's starting to solve. So uh, for us, for example, to be launching stable coins on different chains, we needed to have started four or five years ago, you know, in order to get the licenses necessary, experience, etc., etc., etc. But what we see is that the requests from the ecosystems is to solve the real world problems, KYC, AML, you know, in Web 2, Web 3. So taking it to DeFi, uh, stable coins, uh, compatibility, um, creation of the traditional financial products. Mm. So what, in my view, this wave of the uh, crypto winter will bring is real world examples which are very much resembling what we already see in the non-blockchain world coming to the blockchain and furthermore developing the blockchain ecosystems. Mm. Pranith, this is something I've been hearing a lot about, which is real world assets coming on chain. Is this, is this actually becoming a reality or is it a talking point? At least from what we've seen on the institutional side, not yet. Um, there's, there's definitely been interest. Um, there's been 
some notion of progress as it relates to people's understanding of what it means to start thinking about issuance, about the life cycle management of, of these, these kinds of assets, but there still seem to be um, gaps as it relates to the quality of assets that, that we're trying to bring on chain, and that is what is, at least from, from what we've seen, been keeping people back. Um, but, but again, to, to that point, I guess, um, if we are kind of seeing new ways of tokenizing even crypto native assets and actually thinking about associating value with, with things that were a lot more intangible. And so mechanisms that, that, that have been put in place have been helpful to define like a new class of, um, you know, like assets, if one might call it that, terming it very loosely. But, but things that, that were pretty intangible have actually started taking shape. And that's, that's what people have um, started thinking about giving value to. Is there a specific real world asset that is maybe catching the most attention? At least from a yield standpoint, short D to T bills. Mm -hmm. So um, rates are high. It makes a ton of sense for people to, you know, like uh, look at DeFi rates and compare that to what 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 what's what's happening, you know, like with with T bills and 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 basically use that as an opportunity for people to to migrate capital from from DeFi, get arbitrage, and you know, like maybe use use that as a basis to. Not, not just hedge their positions, but hopefully use that as a way to pump more capital back into crypto. So, Katrina, RWA is? Um, RWA, admittedly, is not a thesis focus of Portal Venture. However, I did notice the convergence of some deep-end projects to RWA, because depending on how you define it, decentralized physical infrastructure and Real world asset, like real world assets, sometimes can be commodity, like whether it's storage or battery. And there are projects like tokenizing battery to provide early liquidity for the storage um, facilities because they their pain point being, you know, they it's it's asset being there um, static for years. So those kind of in the intersection projects are interesting to look at. Though I would say overall it's quite early, and especially when it comes to um, real-world verification, there's challenges there. Mm. We're still early. Well, Are we still early? Only if I get a penny every time I hear that. Yeah, it's, we're, we're somewhat, maybe, I think we're getting to the point where we're like a little, little less early, you know? It's like getting less and less early. There might be some founders or people here who are starting companies or developers. What practical advice uh, can we maybe impart upon them um, from what you're seeing, maybe talking with, with the founders in your portfolio, uh, Alex, what, what are top of mind concerns that maybe you're helping them navigate? Um, both as a VC and as a founder, I think, especially in a downturn, cash is the king. That's always, cash is the king. Now it's for sure. Uh, you may not leave to see your next round, so be very, very cautious. Team is the biggest asset. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people invest into teams. Um, if the first advice is more specifically to CEO, so this is what should keep him at night. Do I have enough money? Do I have the right team? I think in general, the third advice is just try to build something. What is your vision? So what you've set out to do, of course, you need to be flexible. Pivots are happening, but, you know, at least, you know, try to test your thesis, try to, achieve what you set out and only then try to deviate, et cetera, et cetera. This is probably three things. Be consistent, try to do it. That's, that's the third thing. That's the advice to the founders. What say you? I always use the metaphor of what's growing the pie versus slicing the pie. And how I define that is slicing the pie is when you deliver incremental improvement to compete for existing use cases, customers, and liquidity. Versus if it's growing the pie, you are creating net new customers and liquidity. So example of growing the pie, recently I, I feel pretty interesting. I need to do a more te technical deep dive, but uh, SVM is in integration into Ethereum is very interesting. It's benefiting Celestia, Risk Zero, Solana, and enable more developers to be able to tap into you know, the EVM liquidity. So that's a prime example of growing the pie versus 
well, I won't name the example of what slicing. Uh, they are definitely needed. No one's paying attention. This is being recorded. <laughs> Well, the modular thesis, um, a lot of the time, I won't say all of them, but it's uh, slicing the pie a little bit. Uh, I did a deep dive into the MEV space, and I think it's ab absolutely critical. But at the end of the day, um, it's slicing. And uh, the parallel, I guess, in Web2 is sustaining innovation from uh, Christian, uh, Christensen's um, uh, innovator dilemma. So both are important, but one thing I personally focus on more than others. Tishar, uh, what is a uh, prime example you see of, of, of slicing the pie, to use Katrina's metaphor, in this market? It's a good question. Uh, I've got lots of good questions. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have an easy example, actually. Right. I think what we've seen with the major NFT exchanges oh, yes. over That's the course of this bear example. market is very much an example of slicing the pie where the number of NFT traders and drops and volume has all gone down. But we've seen in both the Ethereum ecosystem and the Solana ecosystem something play out, the same exact mm -hmm. thing. You saw this with Tensor taking over Magic Eden in terms mm -hmm. of market share. And you've seen this with Blur taking over OpenSea. And this is very much, in my opinion, something where you're slicing the pie. Mm -hmm. You're not bringing new people in. And what are they competing on? It's trading fees. Mm -hmm. Right, the fees are coming down, and like forty thousand some odd people. Yeah, I don't know what the exact number of people is because you can see the number of addresses, not the number of people, and mm -hmm. it, the the stuff is easily sublable. So who knows? Uh, but yeah, this is clearly compressing margins, uh, and I'm not surprised that that's happening actually, mm -hmm. because I think that at its core. Blockchain is about compressing margins. Mm -hmm. Everything is open source. Everything is permissionless. Way harder to maintain margins when everything is open source and permissionless. And we just saw this play out with a pretty big market in terms of NFT exchanges. I'm just going to interject here and say, I mean, this, this is ex exactly the point I was speaking about at the start, that we have more information, more data points. Mm -hmm. We have more of an understanding in terms of how ecosystems have played out. So. It, and that, that, that in and of itself is extremely helpful in, in, in getting to, to, to understand and maybe inject and instill in developers' mindsets that this is something that has actually played out. Why, why are you trying this out? I mean, it's, it's, it's good that you are, but maybe there's, 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 there's other things that you could try or to, to spend your energies and efforts on. So. It's, it's really interesting. But, um, so, so then how do we grow the pie? Alex? That's a very interesting question. Um, I think growth of the pie comes from uh, a little bit of intuition, a little bit, or to a large extent, knowledge of the market. Um, again, here, you just need to try to understand, in, in the case of the current wave, what would be the real world cases that will attract more and more people to the blockchain. In the case where I work, you know, stable coins, you just take and understand. Instability brings a lot more people and the people uh, in, in the countries with weak financial systems simply to use stable coins because they have very few. So what you try to do, you try to create opportunities for them to easier go to the stable coins uh, to save their uh, assets, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, so you just try to analyze the big picture, you see the big wave, and then you try to understand what would drive people en masse to try to adopt something that is quite obvious. And I think that would grow the pie. Mm -hmm. And it's something that reminds me of um, your colleague, uh, Kyle, um, when we would talk about NFTs, he made the point of comparing it to what newspapers looked like in, in the 90s when that medium first came online. Um, it was effectively just the print paper on a web page. And that was sort of, that was the first iteration, right? And it wasn't only until, you know, several years later that they evolved and became more dynamic. And if you kind of have people approach, um, like with NFTs, just continuing to do that first iteration with PFPs and, and not necessarily evolve into other use cases, 
that's going to continue to to cut the pie uh, rather than expand it. Are there any other examples you can think of that can grow? Maybe like a specific, um, to use the NFT example, instead of coming on as an entrepreneur to do a new way of creating a marketplace, what else can you do that moves, moves the, uh, moves, pushes the envelope, as it were? I don't know that I can comment on what pushes the envelope for the NFT market specifically, Here's but more thing. generally, sure. uh, I think that the next bull cycle in crypto is going to be kicked off by people getting assets on chain without having to buy them. Mm. I think what we need are more users, and I think that we can't ask those users to go through the onboarding friction of buying assets. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that's a huge amount of friction, uh, and that friction's not going to go away. There's lots of companies working on smoothing that out, make the KYC process faster, make the payments easier, mm -hmm. but you are still asking someone to go out of pocket to buy something. Mm -hmm. And I think that the next wave is going to be kicked off by people who get assets on chain without purchasing them. Whether that's going to be, I get an NFT to a sh like a show ticket on chain. I was going to buy the ticket anyway, but I get this NFT now. And now later on, you know, you can see that I've gone to five of your shows, so you give me priority access to purchase, you know, the good seats at your next show. Mm -hmm. uh, or whether it's something in Deepin where, you know, really I just wanted to buy a dash cam, uh, but I happen to also get a Solana wallet because I'm mapping for Hive Mapper and I earn some tokens alongside this high quality dash cam that I have. Uh, or you just give, send me a tip link. And you know, I don't have a wallet or anything. I just get you know, $10 in USDC from you. You send me a link, and it's smooth, and I didn't buy it. And now I will use on-chain services like DeFi not because I want to make money, but because it's the cheapest, easiest, fastest thing to do. And that's where I think uh, we can really grow the pie. It's also evident that um, different. you can't just, you can't, it's, it's hard to get people to spend money to onboard into crypto. But it's also not very effective to, to give them money either. I mean, if we look at the, the data behind, I'm sure this data you've looked at, um, customer acquisition costs vis-a-vis -vis airdrops and liquidity mining programs, abysmal. I mean, the average CAC of, a, of an airdrop is like, uh, I don't know what the average is, but I know that certain ones have been upwards of $10,000 per user. Mm -hmm. That's not sustainable. Uh, agree with me. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, do you have any, any thoughts on that? Sorry, I actually ventured into pontificating there for a second, so <laughs> guilty of my own sin. So what's the question again? Well, do, do you think that in terms of acquiring customers the, or customers, users, past ways of doing it, can they, can they work? Can they be altered? What you're yeah. thinking there? Yeah, ultimately users care about three things. Well, depend on retail or enterprise. Enterprise talk, um, care about top line or bottom line. Are you growing my revenue or are you saving my cost? And I actually think recent um, Shopify integration with Solana is mm. super bullish because now you're actually using blockchain for its purpose to disintermediate and deliver higher efficiency. Um, but from a retail side, they only care about cheaper, better, faster. Mm -hmm. right? so, yeah, all the CAC and airdrop, I think those are temporary. Those are important as any ecosystem bootstrap, you know, what it's, it's kind of two-sided market. And this is the genesis of, you know, ICO in the era of 2017. It's a technology, you need someone to have skin in the game to join the network. Mm -hmm. But that is temporary. Mm -hmm. Also kind of to the point of all protocols, after they decentralize, they will um, reduce emission and have transaction fee to subsidize miner instead of block rewards, right? It's the same trend. But in the initial phase, I do think CAC um, is, is quite necessary, though the definition of CAC <laughs> to me is actually the marketing and sales budget. Mm -hmm. Because what, it, what is it, well, I'm talking about protocol, right? What yeah. protocol is selling is block space. And who's the consumer of block space? It's actually developers. That's why the CAC in this sense, I think, would be the marketing and BD to acquire more developer onto the network. It's an interesting point. If I can add something. Yeah, please. Uh, to, to your point about the CAC being really high due to these airdrops, I think there's actually a very good explanation for it, which is 
founders not putting enough civil protection into their airdrops, and you have airdrop farmers who come in. I don't know any of those. <laughs> and here's the thing. It's really uh, easy to turn a blind eye to it when you're on the team that's building the product that, hey, everyone likes it when numbers go up, and everyone wants to see a, a huge number of users. And it's easy to say, hey, look, we're growing. People love our product, and then stop thinking mm -hmm. and stop wondering, like, wait, why are all these users using the same IP address? <laughs> why do they seem to transact like, in these very peculiar ways? And why have they never done anything else on any other protocol? You know, like the, people just stop asking themselves questions because they got the answer they wanted already. And that's what leads to really shitty CACs, where it's just, oh yeah, well, you're airdropping all your tokens to these people, but it turns out it's like you know, one guy with a bunch of <laughs> different just addresses. Frank, I'm in my basement just <laughs> sibling away. Um, okay, so where do we go from here? What are you most excited about, Alex? What's uh, getting you uh, out of bed and schlepping to Amsterdam? Uh, institutional adoption. Mm. I think the first signs... New LPs. Oh. Sorry? New LPs. Um, that's in the past life. <laughs> As an inter entrepreneur, I think a very, very fundamental change was make adoption in... Europe, and uh, I see a hugely accelerated move of institutions, especially in the countries uh, uh, such as Switzerland, mm -hmm. Liechtenstein, Luxembourg, mm -hmm. to less extent, but still moving towards um, trying crypto in earnest, not paying leap service, not doing it for the corporate brochures, but in essence, really trying to understand how can they do business. And when institutions start to really try to understand how to do business, that means that sooner or later, let's say in five years, that would lead to results. And when large institutions do it, the results may be quite substantial. So that's, that's actually what is very, very exciting for me. Katrina? I have a pretty contrarian one, and some people might laugh at me, but I've been doing a research I don't know on. About this not, <laughs> I'm not laughing at anything. What are you guys on Valium? <laughs> um, I've been doing a research on the revival of the BTC ecosystem uh, to make it more capital efficient. Um, another lever is to make it more programmable, and there are different th schools of thought, but the allure of 3x DeFi liquidity potentially to bring into the rest of DeFi and also as a digital gold, how can we, just like a panda, how do we have panda to have more you know, panda babies so we can have you know, this store of value, basically generate yield on BTC if that's a possibility and the underlying infrastructure needs to be built. Um, and one example being during the height of Ordinal Mint, Binance have to integrate with Lightning Network because of mm. the transaction fee being 20 to $100 per transaction. That's just not, likely, or you know, that's just not feasible. Um, and with the upcoming catalyst of happening of the ETM approval, you know, to your point of institutional more attention to holding spot BTF, uh, spot BTC. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my curiosity lately. Um, I can try and reflect a contrarian view by saying I'm interested in blockchain, not crypto use cases, where um, Essentially, thinking about the, the blockchain as a means for time stamping and having veracity of content or attestations and having those be verified at, at a given point in time and space. And these, these, these forms of um, attestations could be about very simple facts, but they could also be about extremely complex programming systems, things that could live outside the domain of blockchains. Um, things like, I don't know, like, for instance, like a complex machine learning inference system, and then basically thinking about using the ledger as a way for us to actually stop thinking about the content we produce, the way, uh, the way we're going to, the way we would be, would be using that, and essentially trying to actually underpin a notion of credentials that, 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 that is as permissionless and trustless as it should be um, is, is something that truly excites me. 
Perfect. What am I excited about? Mm -hmm. uh, the two things that I'm most excited about are payments and deep end. Mm -hmm. Because, like I was saying earlier, it gets people to use on-chain assets without having to buy those assets specifically. Uh, I like these crypto-native use cases uh, because to your analogy earlier about you know, how newspapers went on the internet, uh, or another way to think about it is like they used to have this thing called the phone book, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Yellow pages, right? And you, and you know what they did when the internet came around? They, they put up yellowpages.com and you mm -hmm. could look up people's phone numbers using this, but actually that's not what search turned out to be. It turned out to be Google. Mm -hmm. And I think you see this same thing here where it's like, you know what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this bond and we're gonna go put it on the blockchain. And to me, that's like the same thing as yellowpages.com or like what the New York Times used to look like in 1995. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, just like it's the same newspaper, but on the internet. And so what I'm really interested in is like the new capital formation that happens through Deepin rather than the incremental improvement. Now look, the incremental improvement is still an improvement and it is valuable and it is good and we should still do it. It's just not what I'm intellectually excited about. Mm. That's well said. I, I like that analogy better than, than Kyle's. So I guess you, you win. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, I think that, that leaves us at time. We appreciate you coming out, taking the time to listen. We'll see you out there at the conference. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.